talking about something called an inscribed angle. We talked about inscribed as a vocabulary word on day two, I think. I can't remember exactly. Um, so we've talked about inscribed in general before. We were talking about inscribed circles or shapes or whatever. This is going to be an inscribed angle. I'm going to draw you a shape or a little visual example and define it for you. So an inscribed angle is an angle whose vertex is on the circle. Do you guys remember what vertex is? The vertex is where the pointy part of the angle is, where the two sides of the angle come together to create the point. So this right here is an illustration of an inscribed angle. The point of the angle is on the circle, it's on the edge of the circle. And so the idea of inscribed that we talked about before, right, I put these little pictures here and out there. I know they're not in your notes, I added them a little bit later. But remember, inscribed means drawn inside of something else. And so that's taking the same idea for the angle. The entire angle is completely inside of the circle and all the endpoints, the endpoint, the vertex, and the other endpoint are on the circle. Just like this triangle, all of the vertices are on the circle. That takes the same idea of inscribed that we talked about before and applies it to the angle. Now what's the angle that we learned about on day one? You guys remember what that was called? Central angle. Central angle. Where was the vertex for a central angle? Around the middle. The center. A central, you don't have to draw that. I just want to illustrate the difference. A central angle that we learned on day one where the angle is equal to the arc. Remember that on day one? That's when the vertex is at the center. This one's different. They've extended the angle upwards so that it's actually on the circle now. And so the measure for an inscribed angle is going to be different. It's not going to be equal to the arc. We're going to talk about what the measure will be in just a second. But first I'm going to talk about what an intercepted arc is. So an intercepted arc is an arc created between the end points of an angle. between the end points of an angle. So if you want to use your pencil or a highlighter if it's handy. An intercepted arc, I'm going to draw a little arrow over here. The intercepted arc would be between the end points of the angle. So that blue one that I just drew, that is an intercepted arc. So if you kind of think about a piece of pizza, an intercepted arc is the crust. So if you have the two end points of the angle here, the bendy part that's inside of the angle or from one end point to the other, that's an intercepted arc. Okay, so you can think of it that way, like a crust of a piece of pizza. Though I would hope nobody cuts a pizza like this, that's a ginormous slice. Um, but the, the rounded part in between the angle is considered an intercepted arc. Okay, so that's just a little bit of vocabulary for you. Now we're going to talk about a theorem, or two theorems, and then two corollaries. Corollary is like a an aside, an extra thing that you could learn from a theorem. They're not brand new. They're like secondary ideas, like bullet points. You have your, your idea and bullet points. These are like bullet points off of this one. Okay. Essentially, this one says the measure of an inscribed angle is half the measure of the intercepted arc. On day one, when we had a central angle, we had something drawn like this, the angle was equal to the arc, right? Remember the angle and the arc were equal when it's central? When it's inscribed, instead of being equal, it's half. It's half the arc. Right? So there is a difference there, so you have to make sure you're paying attention to the picture when you're trying to figure out how big the arc is. So for example, if I put an x here and a y here, the x represents the angle and the y is the arc, what equation could I write? If x is the angle, what would it be equivalent to? No, x is the angle. It should be half of the arc. So whatever the arc is, which is y in the picture here, it would be half of y. So if I said that this arc was 40, how big would the angle be? 20. If the arc was 100, how big would the angle be? 50. If the arc was 180, how big would the angle be? 
90, okay? Go backwards. What if I said the angle was 15? What would the arc be? 30. 30. If the angle was 40, what would the arc be? 80. 80. If the angle was 5, what would the arc be? 10. 10. So when you're going backwards, when you're trying to find the angle, you divide. When you know the angle and you're trying to find the arc, you multiply. So they have that relationship, so make sure you know what direction you're going in. All right, everybody clear on that, how to find an intercepted, sorry, inscribed angle. It's half the arc. All right, for our bullet points, corollary. Our first corollary takes the same theorem, but now we're using it in different scenarios, kind of like what we did last time with our all those different theorems of chords. This one says two inscribed angles, so there are two of them. Two inscribed angles that intercept the same arc are congruent. The long line for the one word. All right, two different angles that are going to the same arc are going to be equal. So I know this doesn't show up on your notes because the color doesn't print, um, but I have one angle right here. I can draw a little arc, call that X. I'll call this X, okay? And then I have another angle right here, the blue one on my screen, I'm gonna call that Y. So two separate angles, X and Y. But you guys see how they're sharing these points? See how the blue and the yellow both go to this arc right here? Do you see that? I know that the, the angles have been swung apart, but they're both going to the same arc. So if I said that this arc, I don't know, I'm just gonna call it 10, what would the measure of angle X be? Five, because it's half of 10. What would the measure of angle Y be? Five. Also five. Because the angle is equal to half the arc and they're using the same arc, they would be equal to each other. So if you see something like this, we have two angles that are, they're sharing two points, but they've been spread apart, those two angles are gonna be the same, because they're using the same arc. Okay. So that's one idea that you guys might see, a special case of that theorem. Another one, okay, my board is not working very well for me today. Another one where the color didn't print very well in your guys' notes, but I have an angle here. All right. This one says an angle inscribed in a semicircle is, and this is going to be a value. So just really quickly, can you guys remind me how much a semicircle is? I know, but if this is measured, 180. Okay, so if I know that a semicircle, which is right here, is 180, how big would this angle be? 90. 90. Always 90 degrees. This is kind of an unnecessary theorem to have because we can just, again, that's why it's a bullet point. We can find uh, an inscribed angle by doing half of the arc, which is what you guys did before I even told you what the corollary said, you said it was 90. And so you can do that every time, right? Half of 180 is 90, but that will always be the case. So if your two endpoints here are with that semicircle, that angle will always be 90, half of 180. You technically don't even need to write that down because you'll be able to do that every time using the original theorem, but something cool enough. All right, our third bullet point, our third corollary. We've actually talked about something similar to this before. This one is going to ask you the, about the opposite sides of an inscribed quadrilateral, and the answer is that they are going to be supplementary. Opposite angles of an inscribed quadrilateral are supplementary. Underline this word, please, or square it or circle it or something. Right? It has to be a quadrilateral, a four-sided figure. Okay, So I drew this arrow. You could also draw this one. I don't know why I didn't draw both. Well, because it was just too crowded. Um, but opposite angles, if they're across from each other, not next to, but if they're across from each other, they would add to 180. Okay? So it's, it's one theorem, but a bunch of different ways that you can see that theorem in different contexts. So just remember your main idea is that inscribed angles are half of the arc, and that you have these different scenarios that are special cases that you can apply that theorem. All right, is everybody okay with those ideas so far? We have a second, second theorem we're gonna talk about before we practice. All right, work this time. All right, theorem two. Theorem two, the measure of an angle formed by a chord and a tangent is half the measure of the intercepted, I'm going 
This is the exact same result as theorem number one. exact same as theorem one. This is just not technically an inscribed angle. An inscribed angle has to be entirely inside the circle, but the angle we're working with right here looks like this. So draw that little, little marking here. This is what I'm going to use to show you what the angle is. So the angle is created between the chord. So let's draw little arrows so we know what the vocabulary word is. Remember a chord is a segment inside of a circle. And then what's a tangent? What does a tangent do? So it stands right over the top of the circle and touches it once. So this line right here is the chord. This one is the tangent. When a tangent and a chord meet, they create an angle, and that's this one, but I'm going to color it. I'm just going to use a different color. This angle right here. Right? That angle that's created between the chord and the tangent, I'm going to call that x. And then the arc that's inside of that angle, which I'm going to trace with blue, that's y. Okay. We're going to use the same formula that we did in theorem 1. x is equal to 1 half of y. So it's the exact same theorem, or same idea as theorem number 1. The only thing that's different is that the angle is no longer inscribed. It's just created by a chord and a tangent. So this one's weird. Because you see how part of the circle is inside the, sorry, part of the angle is inside the circle and part of it's outside? Do you guys see that? We have this teeny little sliver that's outside the circle. That's why it's different than inscribed. It's not entirely inside the circle. But interestingly, the measurements relationship still works. Not exactly sure why. But again, the arc you want to use is the arc that's inside of the angle, not the one over here. It needs to be inside on the interior of the angle. All right, so that's what we're going to be working with today. Theorem number one and its corollaries, so special cases, and then theorem number two. So let's take a look at some practice and see if we can figure out how to apply those theorems in these different scenarios. All right, I do expect you guys to show work here. If you would like to, you could also tell me which theorem or corollary you're using so that you can reference that when you're studying your notes. So let's take a look at this first one. I am looking for the arc and I know the angle. Which one of the, these pieces of information am I going to be using to help me solve here? Theorem 1. Theorem 1. I'm going to be using theorem 1. I'm going to call it T1. Okay? That tells me that the angle is equal to half of the arc. That's what theorem 1 says. It says the angle, which is 38, is equal to half of the arc, which in this case is x. Don't let me, the example equation that I wrote, the x equals 1 half y, confuse you. They can put the x wherever they want to. So the angle is equal to half the arc. How would I solve that for x? Come on, guys, algebra. Oh. How would I solve just that? Do, just do for 1, you just do 38 times 2. Yeah, you multiply both sides by 2 to get x by itself, so it's 38 times 2. 76. Yeah. So just remember, the angle is supposed to be, or sorry, the arc is 2 times as big as the angle. So you multiply times 2 and you get the arc. All right, this one's the reverse. They gave me the arc, but I want to find the angle. The angle is equal to half of the arc. So if the arc is 160, I'm going to do half of that. What's half of 160? 80. So the angle is 80. So this gives you, this is theorem 1 again, just the other way around. So you could be asking the arc for the angle. Notice how for when I was finding the arc I multiplied, and when I was finding the angle I divided. So you have to make sure you know how to use that formula both directions, either to find the angle or the arc. Alright, next one. I'm trying to find this angle x. Now in order to find an inscribed angle, don't you need to know the arc first? Because the angle is half the arc, right? Well, I don't know it. Currently, like they didn't write anything on the arc. But is there a way that I can find that arc? Doesn't 132 equal the arc? Okay, well, what would, I call, what would I call this right here? The central angle, right? And on day one, we learned that the central angle is equal to the arc. So the reason why they gave me that central angle was so that I could find the arc, right? These two are equal. 
but what do I know about x compared to the 132? It's, it's half. The x is half of 132, and so you take that and divide it. What do you get? So be prepared to see both the central and inscribed angle in the same picture, but know how to use them differently. The central angle is equal, the inscribed angle is half, but you're always using the arc to help you. Same arc, actually. Alright, over here, I'm looking for x. What is x? What kind of angle? Well, in terms of the circle. It's the central angle, right? x is now right here. I'm now looking for a central angle, but they've given me the inscribed. But remember, anytime you are finding an angle, you need to know the arc first. So how big is the arc? The arc is equal to x. It's, what's the arc, though? Why? inscribed angle right here. The only number they gave me was the inscribed angle, and the inscribed angle is half of the arc. So if I multiply times 2, that gives me the arc measure. If the inscribed angle is 28, the arc needs to be 56, 2 times as big. And so what's the relationship between the arc and x? If x is a central angle, should it be equal to or half? So once you use the inscribed angle to find the arc, you then know that the central angle is equal to the arc from day one, and you would just say that it's 56. All right, so there are already four different ways that you can use inscribed or central angles or both in these uh, questions. So it's really important you guys know the difference in central angles and inscribed angles and how to work forwards and backwards with those ideas. Questions with the first four before we move on? You guys see how I'm using the theorem? What about this one? Which theorem or corollary would apply to that picture right there? Corollary three. Now, these are both inscribed angles, and so if I knew what the arcs were, I could easily find the angles by dividing by two and solving, right? But do I know anything about the arcs? I don't know what the arcs are, so I can't use that relationship from theorem one. Instead, I'm going to use corollary 3, which you guys can check on your notes. Corollary 3 says what about opposite angles? They're supplementary. They're supplementary. So this is a four-sided figure. I see one, two, three, four sides. It's completely inside the circle. Therefore, the opposite angles are supplementary. So I'm going to add them together and set equal to 180. So 8x minus 6 equals 180. 8x. 186, and then you divide by 8. 23.25? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's, that's an example of corollary 3. When you have inscribed angles that are two angles of a quadrilateral inside a circle, you would use this rule. Please do not say that they're equal to each other. A lot of you guys are just making, like, if you can't figure out which one it is, whether it's equal versus supplementary. You're just picking one randomly when it makes no sense. Does this acute angle look equal to that obtuse one? No. They can't possibly be equal, and yet I still see you guys on tests and things saying that they're equal. You just default to equality. You can't do that. You have to use common sense. Look at the picture and think about what really makes more sense if you don't know. It's probably going to be the one that makes more sense visually. Okay, this one. Which one of our theorems or corollaries would apply? Corollary one. I have two different angles. I have angle X, which is right here, and then I have angle Y, which is right here. Are they both going to the same arc? You guys see how the crust for both of those slices is the same? Both have the same intercepted arc here. So what's the measure of angle X? If the arc is 110, how would I find X? So I'm going backwards. I know the arc. I'm trying to find the angle. What do I do? Divide by 2. Everybody should be able to see that immediately. And this is not hard stuff. Right? 
The arc is 110. You divide by 2 to find the angle because that's the relationship between the arc and the inner inscribed angle. What's half of 110? 50. Okay. And then using corollary 1, if both of these angles are using the same arc, if I know x is 55, what's y? 50. Also 55. You could do the question all over again. You could say, okay, the arc is 110. I'm dividing by 2. You can still do that. It works the same. But using that corollary, once you know one, you can immediately say it's equal to the other one instead of having to redo the question again. All right, what about this one? This one's a little bit more complicated. So I have a 90 degree angle right here. This is an inscribed angle. If I know that the angle is 90 degrees, what is x, the arc? 180. Because remember, the angle is half of the arc. So if the angle is 90, then the arc has to be 180, because half of 180 is 90. Okay? Now, y equals 182. No, it does not, because y is only talking about oh, this right here. Right. So That'd this is actually 90. a flashback to day, uh, day 3, what we did last time. These two chords are equal, so what do I know about these two arcs? They're in half of no, 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 180. No. If these two chords are equal, what do I know about the arcs? They're, They're equal. equal. That was from yesterday. If chords are equal, then arcs are equal. Talked about that yesterday. Well, if I know that both of these are y, okay, what this we said this was 180. So what's the rest of the circle that I didn't highlight? 180. Also 180. But both of these two pieces are equal, so it's essentially taking the 180 and cutting it in into two equal parts in half. So what would y be? 90. So I like this question because it does take lesson three and lesson four and put them together. You have to take that idea of the chords being equal to know that the 180 was being cut in half. All right, so expect to see that kind of stuff, things from day one or day three or day two all merging together um, in the same question. And then we have this one right here. I'm looking for this angle. This is theorem two, in case you guys can't recognize that. If you see a tangent and a chord creating an angle using the same relationship as inscribed angles. So if this is the arc, what would x be? How would I find x if I know the arc is 172? And you divide by 2. Divide by 2, just like we did for inscribed. So I'm going to take 172 and divide it by 2. That gives me 86. Okay, so again, anytime you guys see an inscribed angle where the vertex is on the circle, remember that the angle is half as big as the arc. Can go in either direction depending on what information they use. All right, we have several more examples to practice on this page just to make sure that all this information is settling in correctly. All right, which rule would I use to solve this one? You can look back at the pictures of the, the theorem and the corollary if you need to, but which which one of the rules that we talked about would apply to this one? Hmm? Which one? Theorem one? Corollary one. This is going to be corollary one. If you guys see two inscribed angles, all right, I have one angle right here, and then I have another one right here. You can even use two colors if you want to to trace them. All right, those two angles are going to the same arc. So what do I know about these two angles? If they're going to the same arc, what do I know about them? They're, they're equal. equal. So these are not numbers, instead they're expressions, so I'm just going to set them equal to each other. So if you have two angles going to the same arc, they must be congruent. And so you set them equal to each other and then solve. Subtract the 2x and then add the 3. You get 14 equals 2x. Divide by 2, you get 7. Right, you have to be able to recognize what rule you're using just based by what you're given. Alright, what about this one? Here's a tangent. Here's a chord. Here's the angle that they create. How would I find angle A? Divide what by 2? Yes, you take the arc, which is 256, and you're going to divide it by 2, because the angle is half of the arc. So if I take 52 and sorry, 256 and divide it by 2? 128. 128. The 
just keep saying it to yourself. The angle's half the arc. The angle's half the arc. As long as it's inscribed or you'll have a tangent and a chord meeting the angle right there. So essentially, if the vertex of the angle is on the circle, it's going to be half. Half of the arc. Just remember that every time. All right, this one's a little bit more complicated because we have four different angles that we're trying to find. Okay, let's start with angle one. Angle one is created by these two segments. All right, I've highlighted angle one. What do you think the measure of that would be? Think about it. How big is the arc? That's the crust of that. The rest of it? The, the arc. How big is the arc that's created by angle one? Yeah. This right here, this dotted line, they drew that on purpose. That's a uh, diameter. That dotted line is a diameter because it goes through the center. And so angle one is an angle attached to a semicircle. So how big would angle one be? It's 90. Remember, half of a semicircle is 90. The angle is half the arc. And if the arc is 180, the angle has to be 90. We can do the same thing for angle three. I'm going to skip numbers. You don't have to find them in the order that they're given. I'm going to skip numbers to angle three. What would the measure of angle three be? 90 as well. 90 as well. Because angle three is also an angle that's creating a semicircle. It's just the upper semicircle instead of the lower semicircle. And so those would both be 90. Another way you guys can figure that out, remember, what's the relationship between opposite angles? No. Opposite angles? No. Nope. They're supplementary. Alright? So if you know one angle here, then those two have to be supplementary. That's another way to show that it's 90. Alright? So let's skip to angle 4 and angle 2 now. Alright, do I currently have enough information to find angle 2? No. No. But I can find it. I can find it. So angle 2, I'm going to erase the colors I have right now. Angle 2 is right here. Okay? The arc that it's using is this one that I'm highlighting. Okay? A really good way to do this if you guys are confused with all the lines and the arcs and everything overlapping is to use color coding. So you trace the legs of the angle and then you fill in the crust. Remember what I was describing the crust? All of the circle that's in between those two endpoints, you can use one color to trace that and that'll isolate the information you're using. So how would I find this blue arc? I need to know what that, in order to find angle 2, I need to know what that is. Me... You can subtract 360 by 80 and 60. Yeah, so remember the full circle is 360. I know this is 60 and that's 80. So if I subtract that away, I can figure out what the remainder of the arc is. 60 and 180 added together is 140. So if I take that away, take the 140 away, what do I have left over? We have 70. Don't do the division yet. I was asking just for the arc. Okay. So the arc itself is 220. So if the arc is 220, what would the angle be? 110 is half. The angle for angle 2, because you're finding that one next, angle 2 is half the arc, just like it always would be for an inscribed. So if the arc is 220, then the angle is 110. All right, now we're going to solve for angle 4. There are two ways to do that. Angle 4 is using the 60 and the 80 as its arc, and so the full arc would be 140, and you could divide that in half. So what would angle 4 be? 70. What's another way that you could have found angle 4 besides doing that? Yes? Mm -hmm. Once you know angle 2, remember that opposite angles are supplementary inside of the quadrilateral here. So if you know angle 2 is 110, you know they add up to 180, so you can subtract that way. There are multiple ways that you can find this information. Just use the one that makes more sense and jumps out at you first. Okay. So again, color coding is one way. Again, if you wanted to work with angle 4, you can pick a different color and go like this. It helps isolate angle 4 and its arc because you're using one color. So color coding can help sometimes if you're confused with all of the lines and angles going everywhere. Alright, so this one is pretty straightforward. How would I find angle x? You would subtract all the numbers by 360. Uh, that is the long way of doing it. It is still valid, but it is the longer way. What is a faster way that I could do this? Um, mm 
remember that opposite angles, angles that are on opposite sides of the quadrilateral are supplementary, they're inside of a circle. So I can say that x plus 105 equal 180, and then subtract. But Henry, yes, you could still add them all together and set equal to 360, and you still get the same answer. Yeah, but that was not way too longer. I mean, not, not much that much longer, longer yeah. but it's still valid, okay? okay? So feel free to do that if you want to. Yeah. The only thing that, Henry, you would not be able to do that, let's say I had the I was solving for both x and y. If and I had x works. here and y here, I wouldn't be able to do yeah. that, so you'd have to use a supplementary. Yeah. Okay, so just remember that rule. All right, this one in particular, color coding is going to be helpful. So. First, I'm going to solve for A. So see how I use color coding? I trace the angle and the arc that has to do with A. And so I've now isolated all the information. The 60 is the inscribed angle, the A is the arc. So what would the value of A be? 120. Because the angle is half of the arc, so the arc has to be 120 in order for the angle to be 60. Okay, so that was A. Now I'm going to switch colors to illustrate, and now I'm going to do B. So I trace angle B, and then it's arc. I, cr I just found angle, or sorry, arc A, right? I just found it. That was 120. So what's the full arc for B? Isn't it 120 and 30? Yes. So isn't it mm -hmm. The angle that I'm using, sorry, the arc that I'm using for angle B is the 120 and the 30. So I've gone a little bit further on the circle. So the total arc here is 150. So if the total arc is 150, what would the angle be? 75. It would be half of 150, which is 75. Remember, the angle is half the arc. So once you know what the arc is, you can divide by two. <coughs> so again, color coding can really help you see that. Use your, <laughs> your colors to isolate the angle and the arcs that are working together. So I highly recommend. <coughs> All right, next one. I'm looking for this angle right here. What arc would I use to find that angle? Think about a mouth. Think about the angle as like an open mouth. I want to use the arc that's inside the mouth. Just like we did for these angles, it has to be inside the angle. So the arc I'm using is this one. But have they told me what that is? No. No. They told me the other one. Henry? Yep. So the full circle is 360. They gave me the other section. I want this one. So I'm going to subtract the 128 away from 360 to find what's left over, the arc I actually want. And so that is 232. So the arc I actually want is 232 after I do that subtraction. And what's the angle's relationship to the arc? It's half, just like Schwartz, half of the arc. So if the arc is 232, what would that, which is? 116. So in all these situations, when the vertex of the angle, whether it's inscribed or this weird situation, if it's on the circle, then it's half the arc. Right? Pretty clear so far. I'm going to, for a final example, guide you through this one. And then I'm going to have you guys do the entire bottom piece right here on your own. Okay, so make sure you're asking questions if you're not completely sure how I'm doing these, because you're about to do them by yourself. Oh, oh, oh alright. Doesn't work. So again, I'm going to use my color coding to help because there's even more lines going all over the place in this one. So I'm going to illustrate even how useful this is even more in this scenario. Alright, which one do you guys want to try first? You don't have to find them in the order that they're written. Probably. Anybody have one that they're super interested in? Or that they think they could find pretty easily? Anybody? E. B? E. Oh, E. Okay, E is right here. So cool. Here's angle E. Here's the arc. Okay. How would I find E? Divide 76 by 2. Very good. The angle E is the arc divided by 2. So since the arc was 76 and I divide that by 2, I get 38. Awesome. All right, somebody else pick one. What? B. B? Okay, so B is right here. Here's angle B. And here's the arc it uses. How would I find angle B? 110 divided by 2. 110 divided by 2. Which is? Good. Next. D. Okay. Angle 
D is an arc, the angle that works with angle D is angle A. I do not know either of those things. Okay? So I have to think about finding D a little bit differently. I can't use A to find D because I don't know A. So what's a different way that I could find uh, arc in D? Yes. yes. So D and the 110 together make a semicircle. You guys see that? I have the diameter drawn. So D and 110 together is a semicircle. So I know that they both add to 180. So if I subtract the 110 away, it's 70. And that would mean you could find A. And now that means you can find A. So now that I've found the arc, I can find the angle related to that, which I still traced, even though I knew I couldn't use A to begin with. But now that I know the arc is 70, what would A be? 35. 35, half of the arc. And then lastly, I have C. Which is this. What's the arc? I need an arc to find an angle. 104. No. Uh, well, actually, Maybe. might be. Oh yeah, you're right. How did you do that? Um, um, seventy six in the zones. Seventy six and well, one hundred four are supplementary. Mm -hmm. So if this is a semicircle on the upper half, shouldn't the bottom half also be a semicircle? Right. Mm -hmm. So if I had seventy six here to finish the semicircle, to finish the one hundred, I don't know if you guys can see that, but to finish the one hundred eighty, I had to get that that was one hundred four. So just like we found D up here to be 70, I can find this arc to be 104. And then to find C, what do I do? Um, divide by 2. Divide by 2. Take the arc, divide by 2, 70. All right, so it doesn't matter how many angles are actually looking for, you can still find that information. No, sorry, not 70. I don't know why I wrote 140. I'm having trouble with writing 52. orders. Yeah. Past couple of days, I've been writing well, letters. I, or I the actually numbers put backwards down 140 as well. <laughs> Sorry, 52. What do you guys are after for that one? Okay. So feel free to use the color coding if it's helpful. If it's not and you're fine, just kind of look at it. That's fine too. But I personally like using the colors. All right, I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and work on this last section by yourself, please. Feel free to use color coding. There may or may not be additional lines you have to draw into the picture in order to answer some of the questions. So be prepared to draw a radius or diameter potentially if there isn't one already. Uh, so I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on this. You can get out highlighters if you want to, um, work together, ask me questions, whatever. But take a few minutes to figure out all eight of those measurements and then I'll put the answers on the board so you can check. All right. So you guys are finished or close finished? Anybody have any questions about any of these? Or are you okay finding those? Again, I did incorporate a mixture of inscribed and central angles, so look out for those ones you have to draw that line to create the angles. So make sure you're looking out for the difference between central, which is where the angles are congruent to the arc, and then inscribed where it's half of the arc. You have to make sure you can see the difference and remember the difference when you're solving. So is everybody okay with this little section here? No questions? Everybody's good? Okay.